All right. Good morning, everyone. Point. Okay. Today, the operative thing, and Zoom people, there's no one on Zoom, so whatever. I can do whatever I want. Yeah, I'm done with you guys. Uh, <laughs> let's get another recording later. <laughs> Anyone who's watching this on Vandal Catholic later, oh, wow, when it goes viral, there's 110,000 views. I want you to know, seriously, everybody in the parish in Augustine, when you're watching this later, you're like, oh, this is so interesting. Why are you not in class? All right? And maybe you should not watch the video. <laughs> I'm kidding. If there are people later that are watching this, maybe from a bunker after the apocalypse, then well, you know, welcome and good found footage of what life was like before or whatever. Um, okay. <laughs> now, the, the last point here, approximately 20 easily identifiable causes of the Great War. My friends, I cannot contain my excitement because I'm serious. Next week, we begin the First World War. We return to Sarajevo rehash the assassination and then start talking about the war itself. And all of you already now have known long-term causes. You've known the characters very well. We talked about the characters that class and you're, we're gonna recap at the end here, 1789, 1870, 1904, 1913, these big kind of main causal, causal points that um, maybe don't have direct effects on the war, but certainly contribute to it. Historians to this day, people, 35 times smarter than I am. And I mean this sincerely. People that are, I'm, I'm not a World War I expert. My, my expertise in, in history is civil war. It's a class we'll offer in the spring. But people that have studied the World War I, not how, how I have for months preparing this, but years dedicated their life to it, they can't agree what caused World War I. They can say the proximate cause, certainly the assassination of Franz Ferdinand and Sophie and their unborn child at Sarajevo. That, yeah, that, that's, um, that's obvious. Um, that, that sparks the whole thing. But in terms of what actually sets the preconditions and the long-term effects, it's really up to, 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 to debate. But what's cool is all of you will know, all of you will have these 20 kind of points that you can latch onto and formulate somehow in your own head. And if you choose to do the test, um, just for the fun of it, literally, I'm gonna test myself and see how much I know, uh, you, you can talk about these, these points. We talked last class about 10 other things, right? Which you can recap a little bit. Let's, let's even recap now in our mind. What are some things we talked about last class? Causes, parties, so we talked about Franco-Prussian War, number one. And what was the big thing in the Franco-Prussian War? What was the big thing that really might, it's right at the beginning of our timeline from 71 to 1914, but it might be the kind of big, big cause of the war. What was it? What do we talk about? World War I. Hmm. World War I, excuse me, with the Franco-Prussian War. Uh, wow, what's the answer? Franco-Prussian War and, 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 and Alsace-Lorraine, revanchism, right? That, the, the, the famous um, painting, a Northeast Territory that was ceded or taken by the Germans, right? That maybe is, even though it's the beginning of the timeline and 40 some years before the outbreak of the war, that could be the number one kind of cause that the uh, French are so desirous to regain Alsace-Lorraine at all costs, they are willing to do what actually happens and have millions and millions of men die in trenches to regain what they look at as their full territorial in, 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 you know, in integrality. We talked about the Treaty of Berlin in 1878 signified the, the rise of Germany eight years later that they're a big power broker, they could hold a big conference. And that coincided very, very well with activity in the Balkans. I'm gonna to today talk about the annexation of Bosnia-Herzegovina. I misspoke last class. I said it was annexed in 1878, it was not. In 1878, it was just given protectorate control by Austria-Hungary, okay? So please scratch that from your previous record. Uh, in 1878, they did not formally annex Bosnia and Herzegovina. They just kind of um, took over oversight status. 30 years later, we talk about saying they formally annexed it. We talked about the alliances, right? We talked about the various alliances that were um, brewing at this time. And we said, what was the big, what's the most depressing point for Germany? What's the most problematic point for Germany in that time period from 1871 to 1900? What really happens that, that breaks their diplomatic um, genius or diplomatic outlook. What singular event? The removal of Otto von Bismarck by Kaiser Wilhelm in 1890. Remember? Kaiser Wilhelm is going to show everyone he's the big man. I'm emperor, right? You're not. I'm emperor. I can't have Bismarck hanging over my shoulder. <laughs> this guy's a legend. I'm not. He's got a triple IQ that I have. He's got a bigger Q rating too. It's the real thing. Q rating means how famous you are. Dead serious. You can look up curating, you can believe me. He's more famous, he's, he's the father of the nation, he's the guy. I can't have this, I'm the Kaiser, me. I'm the important, right? I'm VIP. It's like uh, Will Ferrell wants to do a Saturday Night Live skit where he's selling an infomercial and it's a hat that said, I'm number one. It's like, this way everyone will know 
Like, you know, you're number one. Not everyone will too. It's me. I'm number one. And there's something to this kind of like petulance of like Kaiser Wilhelm has to assert himself and literally cut off his nose to spite his face. Having Bismarck in charge of diplomacy is that's 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 what you need. He's a diplomatic genius. And remember, what was Bismarck so good at? What did I, I pledge this to you? I said I'm pleading. Listen, what is he so good at? He's not good at real politics. Real politics, exactly. Perfect. Real politics, realism, and playing people off each other, and where we don't take them off enough where they want to fight us. We take them off getting a little bit weaker. Everyone gets weaker. We get stronger. We win. What does real politic switch to when Wilhelm removes the Kaiser? What was that name? Real politic becomes what? It becomes world politic, belt politic, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, I need a place in the sun, right? No longer is Germany going to be content, which is intelligent, I think, with like just what they have. And let's keep winning our awards in science and, and, and you know, worrying about our territorial integrity. Now we're going to go try to get colonies, do all this bunch of stuff. That's going to tick off a lot of people. And that's what we're going to talk about today when these alliances start forming. Okay, right? Okay, point number one. Uh, I don't know why someone put eight. Someone trolled me. Good. Well done. That was well done. Seriously, nice. That's really good. I'm serious. I thought I thought I messed up. Let's see. Oh, did you get that wrong? That's good. No, I'm serious. Whoever did that, nice job. I was like, there we go. That's good. Did you do that? That's really good. Seriously. I am. That's awesome. I'm not mad about that. Like if someone raised my whole board, I'd be like, that's too far. That's too much of a prank. I need these notes. But that was good. I was like, did I really write next to you? Yes, no, I didn't. I don't make mistakes. So <laughs> okay. This is a huge important event. I have listed these things chronologically, right? I have listed these things chronologically. But you could argue in the last two lectures that number one has been number one in importance as well. The Franco-Prussian War happens to be in 1870-71 at the beginning of the timeline. You have to talk about it first. Well, it just happens by happenstance. Sorry for the double use. It happens by chance, whatever, coincidence, to also be the most important cause, perhaps, of the war. This Alsace Lorraine, the ranches, and if you're already getting annoyed, like you said this 10 times, good. I hope you're remembering them finally, right? How important that, that is. This also is massively important. 1903, Serbian assassination puts in power the irredentist terror question, players, that sets the condition for 1914. What is 1914? 1914 always, right? Should be this here. So triple star, how do we arrive in Sarajevo on that fateful day? Um, This Serbian assassination, 11 years prior, okay, obviously we're not talking about Franz Ferdinand, okay? We're talking about the assassination of the Serbian king and queen. In Serbia, in Serbia, there are two main factions. Serbia, to be mean, is a joke of a country. They have to rely on a bigger power to help them, like a a kind of a sponsor, patron. To be nice, you can say, Serbia is developing into its own power paradigm. And it's still humble in power. It needs some kind of advising. However you want to look at it this time, Serbia cannot stand alone. We can't go it alone. What are the two main influencers in the Balkans acting upon Serbia? Who? Okay, you're one for two. If you're playing baseball, you're batting 500. That's great. Good job. That's awesome. That's nothing to stop at. That's awesome. One for two every day. The Russians. Ottomans, X. Remember the Russians' favorite hobby, meeting the Ottomans in battle? Ottomans, no. Um, Ottomans are super omnipresent. We're going to talk about the Ottomans down here in a second. And I'll have to, unfortunately, use my computer notes, which is really frustrating because I want to have it in hand. I want to have it on my notes. I left in the car today. How, how sad is that, right? You know, I remembered my head, but forgot my notes. <laughs> Why can't it be the other way around? I came to class headless, but I had notes. Like that. Yeah. It, wouldn't it be creepy if, like, you, <laughs> you painted your face with such kind of paint? And it was like, here you are, like, that's not going to be cool. Listen, give me a chance. You paint your face with some kind of like Hollywood stuff where it was perfectly reflective. And I had like a thing, I'm gonna click a light that flashes, right? It's gonna act on the paint. 
So when I click the light, it makes my head like camouflage in the background. It makes it look like I'm headless. How creepy would that be? Like I press a button, my head disappears and they come back on. And you're like, and I don't know, I did it. And it was like, I acted like nothing happened. I'm like, oh, okay. So I just kept talking the whole time. And you're like, I, I swear, it's like 1908, his head just, it, it was gone. Like, <laughs> puts it back. What is going on? And I never explained it. Like, never, right? That's somehow believable. Come on. <laughs> like, use your imagination. Um, <laughs> what is Harry Potter? Not Harry Potter, sorry. Um, one of the uh, Percy Jackson books. Hmm. That's interesting. I've never read Percy Jackson. I read, I tried reading Harry Potter and I was like, wow. And <laughs> Percy Jackson never read because his name is Percy Jackson. I mean, you lost me at the name. I was his author, you know? Um, okay, so hmm. 1903. Serbia has two main influencers, okay, on social media, Russia and Austria-Hungary. They are both vying for power in the Balkans. I will provide the answer as to why, for the sake of time. Russia is a Slavic power. So they look at the Serbians and they look at the Slovenians and let's say even the Poles who they hate and it's mutual and stuff, but Russia looks at itself or wants to be this great Slavic protectorate power. Right, we are the king of the Slavs. We are uh, all Slavic people look to us. Okay, we all come from a common stock. We are we should we should be in charge like in a paternalistic sense, not boss them around like a good daddy, the good czar of our our, our Slavic children. The Serbians, do they, do they agree with this? Not really. They're like they want to be independent. But hey, we'll use in politics. What do you do? Right, you never turn down an opportunity that benefits you. This helps us. That, that's great. Yeah, we'll be all about, you know, in fact, when the July crisis begins, mark my words, remember this, we'll come back to it later. When the July crisis begins, the Russian diplomats or Serbian diplomats are firing off wires to Moscow, to St. Petersburg, saying, please help us. Oh, good czar, like, like really, like really sycophantic, butt kissing letter, like, oh, you know, elevated, all powerful czar, come help your poor children, like literally crap like that. Like literally, that's the, the verbatim formulation of the word. So, so there is this kind of like weird relationship where, the Russians are like, we're the protector of the Slavs. The, in the population at this time, Russia is by far the most populous country in Europe. It has like 190 million people, I think, or something. Or it's just significantly larger than France and Germany. And that's why the war will be so shocking because World War I will equal defensive strategy. It doesn't matter how many men you have, it matters how many machine guns, artillery fire you have. And it's a real big change. We'll go into the war thinking, if you have most men, you just throw them on the battlefield and they're just gonna boom, 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 and whoever has the more will win. And that, it would make sense for fighting with swords or muskets, but World War One, as you'll find out in extreme detail, changes that whole thing. The Austro-Hungarians are also interested. In why you're going to see in the maps that Betsy so rudely has been demanding for weeks now. Um, <laughs> what I meant to say was, you're going to see in the maps that Betsy has been so kind because it's so beneficial to the class to ask for. Austro-Hungary stretches down to the Balkans. They just want that territory. The Austro-Hungarians are Germans. They're not Slavs. They look down on the Slavs. The Slavs are wow. It's like the way someone from like me in Pennsylvania looks at people from West Virginia. Well, they technically they're American. <laughs> I'm kidding, by the way. They, I hope all you know this. Like I'm joking. Um, maybe <laughs> With the, when it comes to Arkansas, I'm not joking. For Arkansas, I'm being serious. They look down on the Slavs. Like you want that territory. You understand that? If you're the Austro-Hungarian Empress, right? No offense. You're not. And I'm the Serbian guy. I fear you and respect you, don't like you because you're the German queen, but I get it, why you want our territory? Okay, I get it, it's your fault. So Austro-Hungarians wanted to extend their empire, perhaps secure their empire more, secure their borders, and especially work against this. What is irredentism? Remember, what is it? What is irredentism? It's a very important word to know. Irredentism is revanchism. It is the French attitude in alsace lorraine What is irredentism? Irredentism equals there is a territory that is no longer ours that rightfully belongs to us because of folklore, tradition, blood, whatever. And we want it back. A good example of irredentism would be Ireland. Bet and Betsy has this great point, you know, in the time of troubles. Uh, a lot of people want Irish, super Irish patriots who want one Irish country bemoan the northern, they want Northern Ireland back to one part, part of one country. Taiwan. Would be another. Whew, Taiwan is a brilliant, perfect example. Exactly. Those are all irredentist things. It belongs to us for a reason X. And often, surprise, surprise, the people that have made this thing, they don't agree with you. 
or they don't think we don't think we belong to you, right? Okay. So these are the people that are interested in this area. Up until 1903, at let's say 1903, before this assassination, the Serbian king and queen are pro-Austro-Hungarian, okay? But they are kind of uh, a joke, okay? The king apparently is just completely like, he's crass, he's vulgar, has no clue on how to, and I'm talking about not like in private or whatever, like, in, like publicly, just kind of like, just total like uh, enfant terrible would be the word, just kind of this terrible child, but man-child guy, like I'm king, bring me ice cream, you know, just kind of stupid stuff. His wife, unfortunately, I don't, I don't want to talk bad about people, God, I sell their souls, apparently was like legendarily promiscuous. And one of the guys in the chamber is like, hey, uh, you can't marry this woman. He's gonna go marry her, right? He's like, you can't marry her. She slept with like half the cabinet. And he's like, how do you know? He's like, I hooked up with her. Like, you can't do it, please. I'm serious. Like, no, it's really sad. He's like, oh, no. <laughs> this isn't funny. Like, right? It, it, I don't know why, like, it is hilarious, but it's also not funny. It's really not funny, but it's so funny, right? But like, no, the guy's trying to say, he's like, I look, look, and this is really sad, right? Would that, and this is the message of Fatima for sexual purity and sexual morality, would that all of us lived that? So very, the, the society would be so much better if people had good sexual morals. I think everyone, every Catholic at least, I think agrees, right? But these guys at this time, are, they're very realistic. They're like, look, people are, are scumbags, right? They're promiscuous, whatever. That's fine. This is a whole other level. Like literally, you're the queen, she's, this isn't Franz Ferdinand Sophie. Sophie was, you know, lower born. Uh, she's still a duchess and she was totally, as far as you know, like, you know, a virgin, both of them, you know, were, both of them, I think were, and like they, they did it the right way. This guy's like, this isn't like, oh, you know, she had this lover. Like she's literally like slept with everybody in this room. And it's going to be embarrassing to, for Serbia that like you've married this woman, right? Don't want to talk about her again, God of mercy. But, but that, it's actually kind of exceptional. Catherine the Great was legendary promiscuous, but it was just terrible. But again, like, in the right way, if she had her like ministers or whatever, it wasn't like, uh, she, her, the, the guy that was going to rule the country, the husband was doing all, like, whatever, had gotten half her court infected with syphilis or something. It's like, this becomes a total embarrassment. So the whole monarchy is kind of an embarrassment. It doesn't justify what happens next. Terrorists come into their bedroom, pull them out at night, disembowel them, throw them off the balcony, decapitate them, horrible kind of stuff. And I don't, it's too gross, just God of mercy on their souls. Um, I don't want to talk about these gruesome things. It's the most gruesome thing you can imagine. They're assassinated. And who's assassinated? These king and queen, they're pro-Austria-Hungary. So the Austria-Hungary influence is X, and the people that come in, King Petar, is pro-Russian. Here's, someone help me out, who's really brilliant. What is the problem? Because obviously the assassination is diabolical and you can say it's satanic, right? It's disgusting. Obviously, it's evil, right? Thou shalt not kill all those check marks. I'm not talking about that. What is the political problem? What do I mean here that puts in power the irredentist terror players set conditions? I imagine I'm part of this group. I've assassinated the king and I invite Dave Schmidt to come in and be king. What's the problem now? What is the problem? Someone help me out. Someone help me politically. My group of bad guys, evil guys, have killed the old king and brought Dave Schmidt, pro Russian king, back from exile and made him king. What's the problem? And my guys, remember, we killed the pro Austro Hungarian people. We hate Austro Hungary. What's the problem here? Someone help me out. It's not a trick question, I swear. I'm going to say something like uh, press a button, your face disappears. So this is very simple, very simple thing. I like that I think I've convinced you. I think you think it's possible. It's good. The problem is, is that I rule the country, right? If what, what should you do when you come in? You're the pro, you're the right, you're, you're the king now. What should you do? What's the right thing to do? I'm serious. Alexander III, a Russian uh, czar, one of the best czars ever was called Alexander the Peacemaker because his attitude towards terrorism was like, no, like there's not even any dialogue. You're a terrorist, you're executed. You're, we're not gonna have any terror, we're not gonna have any tolerance. What should you do when you come into power? I suppose make nice with Russia. No, you should execute yeah. me. You should execute me and my conspirators oh. immediately and say, I'm, I'm glad I'm the king. That guy was a bad king. What they did was wrong. And we're not gonna have a terrorist state. And those people are gonna be put to death. That's what you should do. But in fact, you come in and play nice and you act like you owe your power to me. That's great. So I really rule the country. So now from 1903 to 1914, the question is who rules the country in Serbia? Kings or is it a terrorist group, basically? And the, a lot of the same people who do this assassination are the same people who 11 years later give Gavriel Princep guns and stuff and whatever 
And for the, the 11 years, like the, the O3 faction mm. is in power. And Dave Schmidt is kind of a, the, the, the King Peter is kind of a weak knee king. He doesn't want to offend them. I wonder why. Hey, Dave, uh, you want to pass this law? No, I think you might want to pass this law. Remember what happened back in 1903? No, we could arrange that again. We could do a sequel, that kind of stuff. So basically Serbia in this time becomes on this cloud of like, who's ruling the country? Is it legit or is it actually terrorist state? And so when an actual terrorist get involved in the assassination, Gabriel Princip and his co-conspirators, they are aided and abetted by, especially this guy, the main guy, the main mastermind, we'll talk about him a week, no, on Tuesday, Apis, A-P-I-S, that was his nickname, it means bull, because he had a super thick neck, his real name was Dragatun Dragatimovic. He was a leader in the Serbian army. He's influential here and there, right? And the, the question is, is, again, is King Peter the king or is Dragatun Dragatimovic, Apis the bull, the shadow government ruling the country by terror? And if Trish Schmidt, uh, our queen, doesn't enact legislation, well, we can always remind her what happened in 1903, that kind of stuff. It's like, they just, just, you know, these kind of like threats and blackmail and stuff like that. Do you see how problematic that is? So when Franz Ferdinand's going to show up and there's maybe not going to be great security and there's hatred of Austria-Hungary and it's at the very top of the government, is it surprising that these things are brewing? I, I wouldn't say so, right? We'll tease it out more. But this is super, super important. That's the number one thing that it creates this kind of very questionable... Um, milieu of power interactions in the country where we don't know if the, the government's legit or not. Okay, it's very, very. It would be like when John Wilkes Booth assassinated Abraham Lincoln, if he got away with it and then appointed his own king, and all of a sudden John Wilkes Booth, instead of being put to trial, he was a Catholic by the way. Um, his sister said, um, instead of being put to trial and, and, and executed, John Wilkes Booth is like counselor to the king, right? And so, who's really the king? Wow, so John Wilkes Booth, that's all it takes to get to the top of politics. He assassinated Lincoln. Now he's in charge. That seems like a bad precedent to teach people. Like, this is how you gain power, right? Isn't that that's... how the Israelite king things did? Let me explain. Go ahead. If we go look in the Bible, um, we had lots and lots of uh, bad king, kings that were got their jobs by assassination. Yeah, this seems like a human problem. I'm not saying this is exceptional <laughs> Serbia at all. Everyone listening from Serbia, I'm not anti-Serbian. Um, I'm not saying this is a Serbian problem. I'm saying that at this time, this story, that's a great point. It repeats itself from time immemorial uh, is being repeated here. The problem is we're only talking about this. And though that theme is very universal, like you said, really great point, um, but it's still problematic in real time here, right? Point number two, the Entente Cordiale, okay? The friendly Entente, the friendly agreement between Great Britain and France. Okay, guys, again, this is freaking crazy bonkers important. And it goes back to over the little, it goes over to here. We'll talk about this in a second, this little box. All right, remind me to talk about the box. Uh, so tell me later if I forget, like open that box. Let me see what's inside that box. Open that box and then beat box on it. <laughs> If I forget, okay? <laughs> Dave, uh, really, I'm still waiting to hear your response about a possible rap video on Moscow. I'm, I'm looking for maps. So mm. That wasn't what I was talking about at all. So no, off topic. No, no, no. Um, okay, an Entente Cordiale. Great Britain and France become allies. Someone help me out. Who here likes uh, garbage literature like Jane Austen? And I'm kidding. <laughs> Jane Austen is awesome. I actually really like Jane Austen a lot. Dead serious. Colin Firth is Mr. Darcy in the guy who's great. He's awesome. I don't know who plays Elizabeth Bennett in that version, but it's freaking great. A great love story. Jane Austen is awesome. Not saying that to be politically correct. I really like Jane Austen a lot. Austen, the things I'll insult and make fun of, like Dave Schmidt, are people that I like the most. Because um, you kid when you love, right? But Dave Schmidt doesn't make fun of me back, so I think he hates my guts. Oh, yeah, I do. Um, Check online. Which is cool. <laughs> yeah. Check. Wait till you see what I wrote in Reddit. <laughs> this, this forum, this subreddit I started. Uh, someone talked to me seriously about British French history. It's great, right? They get along good. Oh, exactly. This is what is so important. Thank you. This is monumental. In 1904, when the British and French come together, we children of the 20th century, all of us, right? We assume, oh yeah, Great Britain and France are allies because they fought the First World War together. They fought Nazis in World War II, right? We forget how much the British and the French hate each other, okay? We forget about the Hundred Years' War, 1337 to 1453, where Joan of Arc is burned at the stake. We forget about um, all of the kind of like, you know, the, 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 the 
through the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th century, all the horrible amount of fighting, we forget the, about the French Indian slash Seven Years War. The French Indian War is the name of the Seven Years War in the American continent fought before the revolution, 1756 to 1763, where the British and the French decide uh, the, the British winning that war is why we speak English and not French. Uh, so much of the country was under the, the, the provenance of the French empire. They're always fighting, they always hate each other. Who, does, uh, who defeats Napoleon, French, at Waterloo, right? The British do. They hate each other. They're, they're mortal enemies. The, uh, I'm not kidding around. The British French Entente Cordiale would be like today, an Entente Cordiale between Israel and Iran. Every time, now the, the Israeli PM is, um, is um, Neftali Bennett, before it was Benjamin Netanyahu for 621 years. I think he was uh, Israeli PM. Um, yeah, he was personally appointed by Moses. <laughs> Um, <laughs> really, he's forever, forever. He never went away. Anytime Netanyahu or not Natalia Bennett, Natalia Bennett just recently met with Biden. When Netanyahu met, meets with, met with Trump, what was the question always? Prevent Iran from Iran, 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 Iran. Iran was like in like you know every second word. Israel and Iran, Iran. Everything's about Iran, right? Can't because of Syria, Iran, and this Iran, and Iran. If Iran and Israel signed an Entente Cordiale, it'd be like oh, mind blowing. That really be mind blowing. Like well, when Israel and Saudi Arabia had an agreement it's not that's not actually that controversial they both hate iran that's that's the reason why they're, they're allies but if iran and israel like we're joining forces that would be like oh, this is what this is it's crazy after a thousand years of hatred they're together and then the backwards r i, I always use it to symbolize russia the, ba the backwards r is an actual letter in russian it's ya it's pronounced out of me okay so like trish if you were to start a sentence in russian with Cyril, you'd say you had to do a backwards r yeah it means i um, but Russia, you know, if you see why I have backwards R, that just always represents Russia for me. Um, in 07, three years later, Russia joins this kind of entente cordiale, you can say. Remember Bismarck? Bismarck let the reinsurance treaty slip, okay? He let it, uh, and he, no, not him. His people, after Wilhelm removes him, and as Dominic said, goes from real politics to developed politics, he lets the reinsurance treaty slip, and all of a sudden, we're left with uh, a new realignment <laughs> right at the eve of the war. 1907 is how far away from World War I? Seven years only, right? We're, the, we're, we're doing this. We're knocking, right? We're all knocking right at the doorstep. Let's open the box. In 1887, this is pretty, let's look at it from the German perspective. This is very favorable for Bismarck. Rebecca and Dave, can you guys see okay? Uh, maybe, uh, I'm trying to think. <clears throat> Can you guys, can everyone see if I stand this way on the box? I don't want to block people. Betsy, almost. Oh. Betsy, you don't need to see this information. It's okay. As long as everyone else. Okay. Now, is this the same boxes we had last time? It's the same box last time was blank and now it's filled in. So we can, I can move back to that box and fill it in where I left it blank. Like. Yeah, you can if you want. Okay. You knock yourself out. Uh, 1887, from the perspective of the Germans, look, this might be the most important thing I talk about today. I'm serious. Because the, the shift in 20 years really gets us ready for the war. Germany, remember, they signed an a alliance of two emperors with Austria-Hungary, and Italy is involved. So in 1887, Austria-Hungary, Germany, and Italy are allies, like they'll be here. This doesn't, this doesn't change as strong. But what is going on? Well, France is isolated. They're kind of boxed up. The Germans hate the French. The French hate the Germans. Alsace-Lorraine, 16 years later. But the French are kind of neutralized. The Germans have this... R-E-I-N-S, the reinsurance treaty with Russia. Russia is a question mark. Russia is not an enemy. In fact, they're kind of a kind of an ally. And Britain, GB eco-free. What I mean by that is they're just a free agent. They only care about money, the economy. In 1887, things are pretty good for Germany. There's no opposition to this kind of alliance here, Austria-Hungary, Germany, Italy. France is on its own. Britain doesn't care as long as they make money. Russia is a question mark. That's great, right? But 20 years later, while this hasn't changed, this has completely changed because we just talked about now because the Entente Cordiale and because of Russia joining, now you have this. This is World War One. This this is the fault line. Mm -hmm. It's France, Russia, and Britain against Austria and Germany. Italy will actually quickly betray this and join the Allies very very fast within like a month of the war, or a, really a year. But like Italy, just wow. I mean seriously, the guy. <laughs> they, there's a story that that, that the, they're they, they had a treaty signed. This treaty. And it got ruined because a guy came out and dumped a big thing of pizza on top of the treaty and got all the grease everywhere. And they just ate it, ate it, ate it. And at the end, they're like, it messed it up. They're like, it was worth it though. It was really good pizza. And uh, the treaty was over. 
and that's that's Italy. Mm-hmm. And they're like, ah, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the the problem was. Well, never. I'm not gonna make this joke. I'm not gonna make this joke on Zoom. Uh, I'm not. I'm not gonna leave a record. What you were, what you recording. Recording. Pause the recording. Yeah. I'll I'll make the joke at the end. I, I will not make the joke. At, I will not make the joke at the end. I, I will not at the end turn off you and make this joke. I will not. <laughs> okay. Point number three, 1905. Remember the imperial scramble for Africa. Okay. Do you all remember? I said last class. Uh, do you remember last class that I said? The first concert of Europe, which ran from 1815 to 1871, was dominated by the British, but from 71 to 1914, it's the Germans, okay? The scramble for Africa, in many ways, equals that we want our place in the sun, 1897 comment from that German minister, Boulot. For too long, we have ceded, you know, the real world to our enemies. It is time for Germany, for us, to seek our own place in the sun. And often this place in the sun, this is where obviously it's very problematic, right? This is the duh, kind of problematic idea of colonialism. Well, we're gonna seek it by taking people's land, right? By, by incorporating parts of African colonies. Well, this thing has, this thing has two, uh, two um, phases, 1905 and 1911. The Moroccan crisis, the second Moroccan crisis, the Moroccan rebellion, okay? Basically, on March 31st, 1905, Kaiser Wilhelm II arrives in Tangier, okay? And he talks, he speaks, he confers with representatives of the Sultan, Abolis of Morocco. And in fact, he tours the city on a white horse, all right? Just like, Wilhelm was all about PR, okay? Why does Vladimir Putin get pictures of himself taking fishing in Siberian rivers? Because it just looks cool. He thinks, right, like, I'm going to put this on, on the news and people look, look how, how strong and active their president is, right? And, you know, it's like pictures of serious. People bike, they show Biden biking on his birthday. You guys think Biden is so old and washed up? Look at him bike, like that argument. Okay, right? And I totally bought it. I don't buy it. I mean, it depends, like, right? Does it work or not? I don't know. It's propaganda. He tours the city on, on a... On a White horse, okay? And the crisis starts to build when there seems to be this idea that he's gonna wanna incorporate some parts of Moroccan trade and Moroccan territory. Well, this is very, very, very problematic because the French already are supposedly in control of Morocco, okay? And there becomes a real scary possibility of a proxy war developing into something large. What does a proxy war mean? A proxy war was like a big countries instead of fighting each other will go off to fight have their colonies or, or not not necessarily colonies but places they have influence by each other. Okay, is that right? Yeah, it's perfect. Yes. Who else wants to add to that? That's very very good. Proxy war is a big hallmark of what? Of what war? What time period? Perfect, Dominic. Seriously, freaking money. One correct answer after another. Great. Seriously. Yeah, proxy war is, that's what the Cold War is. It's con- Vietnam is a proxy war. Very sad. Uh, you know, the, the, the effect it had on, on American society and all the lives lost. The Korean War, even, you can argue, which is called, sadly, too, the Forgotten War. These are proxy wars where we're involved somehow, you know, what, I don't know, the level of directness can depend, but often, right, it's like, I'm fighting Dave, so I'm going to have Dominic fight Trish. Like they're fighting for us. We know who represents who, who's on whose team. Um, but it's, and then that way, well, we, the two superpowers, the USR and the USSR and the USA can always be like, whoa, whoa, whoa it's not us. It's, it's, it's their fight, their fight. You know? the, the whole thing over Cuba, Grenada, Reagan in the 80s, like to- so many proxy wars in the 1980s. And a lot of it was brinksmanship and threats. This is kind of what's going on here, okay? Well, 1911, it gets more, it gets even more um, brinks, brinksy, it gets even more brinksy. Okay, so a rebellion breaks out. A rebellion breaks out in Morocco against the French, okay? In the interior part of the country and the, and the French have to send troops to, uh, well, to attempt to put it down, okay? Well, the Germans are like, well, remember say five years, six years earlier, five years earlier, excuse me, when we had toured the city in a white horse, when I did, I was going to say, oh, it's really good on the white horse, by the way. Um, it was 
this is perfect. It's like Napoleon Dynamite at the end of the movie when he, uh, in the and post credits, and you have the wedding. And he's like, I came to you while the honeymoon was dying. I rode the honeymoon was dying through the streets of Niger, and everyone waved. And <laughs> to the soundtrack of I love technology. Yes, I love technology, but not as much as you, you see. But I still love technology. The Germans show up with a gunboat. Okay, this time they're not playing around. They don't show up with a white horse honeymoon stallion. They show up with a gunboat. And they're like, we don't object to French control of Morocco. We want some compensations. We want some, just something in this scenario because what we find unfair is the following. And this defines this whole era for the Germans. We find unfair, paradoxically, that we're the best country we're the best. All, all, we have the best technology. We have the best science, art. Uh, we find it unfair because it doesn't, it's a non sequitur. The best country should have a lot of stuff and a lot of powerful things. And it's unfair that by an accident of time, we've arrived at the colonial game 300 years late. I mean, 400 years, you can say. Germany, 1871, is almost 400 years after Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue, right? And, and the port, Portuguese conquests and all that kind of stuff. We have had, been behind by a couple of centuries. Well, uh, negotiations eventually ensue. Cooler heads prevail. The Germans mock the French. It's always a good thing because the French freak out when they, this panther, uh, <clears throat> this panther uh, gunboat is sent and the French back down. And there's a lot of kind of like, you know, drawing a sword and like, or the, the, the famous thing with the, the, the pistols and the, the cartoons where it was like, kind of whatever, ever doing that. And uh, <clears throat> the, the Germans uh, eventually joke like, to the French that, oh, you know, if we really, we next time we won't send like a, a tugboat to arrest you or something. Like, you were so scared of this boat, wait till you see the other boat we got. You know, it's like the fish was this big, you know. Um, the Germans love to have quips like this. Bismarck famously said he thought the British army was a joke and he was kind of, he was kind of right. Um, the British expeditionary force, as we'll see in the First World War, the best, most marksmanship proficient, best shooting force around, but it, incredibly small. It was something like the French and the Germans have like 60 or 70 divisions. The division is about 15,000 men. 60 or 70 divisions at the start of the war, the British had four. The British are naval power. And so someone once asked Bismarck, what happens if the British land their army on your shores, right? Won't you be scared? And he's like, no, I'll have the police arrest them. <laughs> I won't even send the army. I'll have them arrested by the police. Um, so similar kind of rhetoric here, similar kind of like, you thought this boat was big, what do you see this other boat we got? It's like 95 times as big, I mean 195 times as big. Everyone backs down, everyone cools down, but it's seen, here's the problem. The World War I is the hot stove, okay? And people keep doing this. Like, right? And it, you can only do that so long before someone goes, you know, like press your hand down, press your face down. That's what we're getting towards. This is humiliations are happening. Germany is constantly feeling, people that want to argue for German war guilt in the First World War are feeling that Germany is constantly being humiliated to a level where what will eventually occur? They almost snap. They can't take it anymore. Yeah, we're not going to keep doing this. We're not going to keep like literally like, you know, dancing around eggshells with France and, and Germany every time we back off. Things are just becoming intolerable. Well... Okay, let's take a little breath. Something more light, something hilarious. The, um, where is it? What number? The pig war. The pig war was every year in, in, in Austria-Hungary. Don't write this down, listen first. You'll know why in a second. Don't write this down. Um, the Kaiser in Austria-Hungary every year would gather all the pigs in the country into one area and grease them up and whoever caught the most pigs was, avoided, was awarded the title Pig King. And I said not to write this because it's totally false. This is not what the pig war was. That's why I glad you stopped writing. Write this down. <laughs> what was the pig war really? Well, the pig war I know about <laughs> was between the United States and Canada, Britain, um, to um, determine the border in the... Um, in between the at the west between the US and Canada and it was arbitrated by Kaiser Wilhelm II. I've never heard of that. Thank you. 
No, I'm serious. There's he thinks that. Yeah. During it, they um, on San Juan Island, um, there was an American camp and a British camp for years. Mm. Really. Because both countries were trying to occupy the same land. Right. And I can't remember whether it was a Canadian um, farmer that shot an American pig or an American farmer that shot a Canadian mm. pig that started it. Got it. So, 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 oh. thank you. So, the, 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 the whole pig war thing obviously implies the kind of the causal, the main factor that kind of sparked everything. My, my friends at Wiki agrees, Bessie, but it places that escapade in 1859. Well, it, it took years. Mm. Remember, the Civil War happened. But then it couldn't have been Kaiser Wilhelm II. Yeah. It was someone, because he doesn't become emperor until 1888. So it must have been someone. Okay, it was the first, sorry. The first one, okay, the grandfather. Hey, yeah, sorry, first. No, no problem. I was thinking the first, and then I'm like, <clears throat> I think no. We've been talking about the second so much. But yeah, of course, so of course. No, thank you. It was Kaiser Wilhelm the first. I, uh, I I am a historian, so I feel like oh, there's a lot of things in history that I know very very well, and even some things I've heard of. I've never heard that. It's really cool. I love when I like. I'm serious. I've never ever heard of that before. It's awesome. You can still visit camps that's, today. That's, why not? It's San Juan Island is where is San Juan? It's up by. It's in the upper left corner of Washington State. Got it. Okay. Yeah, I think I, I think for actually I, the reason that. I've never been there, as obviously, I don't know where it is, right? I visit there all the time, no clue where I am. Um, we have friends that are moving to San Juan Island from Pullman. That's why the name, when you submit to the mission. visit them and make sure that they live at the camps. I'm really glad and they're leaving. I'm really glad they're leaving Pullman. American don't want to visit them. suicide and the British didn't. Hmm. Why? Um, the British got to um, bring their wives and they had a lovely camp along the water with trees and mm. it was beautiful and nice. And the Americans were on a way up high on barren land where they could see out to see if they were being attacked, but it was not really, it was a very depressing. Could they bring their wives too? No, they couldn't bring their wives. It's too bad. But the British often asked them over for parties and stuff. That's nice. How how is hospitable? (laughs) Well, our pig wars. It's up to you to determine if it's more interesting or not than that. So very good story. Thank you for that. Seriously. Uh, I love a good story. The, uh, the pig war is simply an economic embargo. Okay. So this is Austria-Hungary versus Serbia again. If you're like, wow, talk about typical suspects. Groschen, really? Austria-Hungary against Serbia again? The, again, nothing happens in a vacuum. Sarajevo doesn't happen for no reason. France Ferdinand isn't shot just because, well, someone had to be, right? Like there's a lot of water under this bridge. Uh, <clears throat> Serbia's import or Austria-Hungary, I think, imports a lot of uh, bacon, a lot of you know, a lot of pig from Serbia, and the Austro-Hungarians just totally shut it down. They refused to buy their their uh, embargo their bacon. And why is this problematic? Well, again, one of the first steps in any kind of uh, war is economic sanctions. I think something like fifteen or twenty percent of the world is under U.S. sanctions, right? Where you we can't trade here, can't do this, can't, because it's this big thing with COVID, right? When it was like with masks and then like needles and vaccines with Cuba, because we have an embargo rules. So like, that's the, the thing, right? We, we don't trade with them. If I don't, if, if your main export, if, if, okay, imagine if you have a, a booth at the farmer's market, but all of Moscow's agreed to shun you and not buy your product, that really sucks for you, right? You spend a lot of money in your booth. And by the way, you make the most delicious, let's say, you know, muffins or whatever apple pie and like people want to buy it but by law they can't buy from you it's going to really tick you off you can you're not be able to feed your family you can't support your product okay this thing eventually blows over but it's like by hook or by crook one way we're going to try to piss you off that becomes the mess from both ends. we're going to threaten annexation take stuff maybe not maybe not buy your main crop maybe talk to your enemy like it's just a lot of like brewing this kind of stuff again fire touching going on in the balkans 1908 becomes double star. This is the most important event, probably. If you're like, gosh, you say that all the time. You're such a BSer. You're so legendary BSer. All you say, this is so important. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, I'm not going to listen to you anymore. This is this really is super, super important. When I go over the 20 things. I'll, I don't know if I'll be able to rank them mentally, but this is definitely up there, probably top five, the 20. Remember, I already said Alsace Lorraine is huge, right? I would say also 1903 Serbian assassination is huge. This one is also up there somewhere. As I misspoke last class, as I mentioned that I misspoke last class, in 1878, all that happened was that Austria-Hungary is like, we own Bosnia-Herzegovina. It's our area, but not 
officially, which is kind of like they have quote unquote autonomy. What does it mean to annex a country? What does that mean? It means literally to make it formally fully part. When we annex Texas in 1845, uh, we like we Texas becomes a state soon thereafter, right? It's part of the United States. It's when it, when Texas is annexed into America, it's not like oh, there's there's the states and there's Texas. Texas is like a territory. No, Texas is as much the state when it gets annexed as New York as as Iowa as anyone, right? So annex means to formally incorporate. Now, please, Cold War style. Is the U was the Ukraine during the Cold War annexed in the Soviet Union? It was. The Ukraine was one of 16 provinces of the USSR. Poland was not. Poland was a satellite. It was kind of dominated in the Soviet Union, but not officially. That's the difference. Serbia never gets officially annexed in Austria Hungary ever. It always has autonomy. But these pressures, and remember the two big benefactors, uh, Austria Hungary versus Russia, which would be a great key to how the war breaks out. I'm loving how this class is developing and thinking of the things we're talking about. It's like you're really being well prepared, I think, to understand this perfectly. People have said, I think there's more information written on World War I than anything else. There's, it's impossible to get through it all. And it's so confusing. And professional historians who dedicate their lives, like I said, can't make heads or tails. I think we're doing a pretty good job. I really do. I think you all will leave this class like, I got this pretty good, really. This is a huge move because now all of a sudden, right, Bosnia and Herzegovina, where a lot of Serbians live, Gavrilo Princip is a Bosnian Serb. Okay, please note that. But remember Serbia, what kind of country is Serbia? Is it, who's it being run by? Question mark, I don't know. Princip is Serbian, but he's actually Bosnian nationality. So his own personal country, talk about irredentism of the max, has been not just protectorized, but officially moved into the people that we hate, right? Okay, there's a lot of stuff brewing here. And in Serbia, let me go off the cuff a little bit, freestyle, rap style. I won't actually rap, but like that, but in a spoken way, um, <laughs> without rhyming. So, so not at all. So not at all. Nothing like that. Um, you have to realize too, in the Serbian tradition, the, remember, focus on this today, these conditions, right? In the Serbian tradition, there was this sad kind of thing, sad, almost like suicide pact, depressing, I don't know what the word is even for it, but kind of idea, national ideal, that the greatest thing you could do for your country in Serbia was die. Uh, Patton had a famous quote. Patton, George Patton, great quotes. Some guy, some young kid was talking to him. And Patton goes, damn it, son, I don't want you to die for your country. I want that SOB to die for your country, his country. That's the point of war. You know, stop talking about dying. I want you to defeat him and we win. Yeah. Serbia, there was this like, it, it's like you want to also die. That, that is good. It's like it's almost sick. It's kind of macabre. It's like as Catholics, right? Our attitude should be like St. Thomas More. We love life, but we love the truth above all. And we're ready to die whenever our Lord calls us. And we're, but we're not happy about death itself. We're just happy to do what God wants. This is like a death cult almost idea of like, I want to assassinate someone and then be killed in action. And that's like the greatest thing. Already by 1910, there's this one student who tries to kill the governor of one of these provinces, the Austro-Hungarian governor, fails, commits suicide. And he's held up as like, that's the ultimate, the way I would like look at someone who like won a Nobel Prize in literature or a great Olympic lifter. Like that's what he's been inspired to. Sadly, a lot of the Princip, these guys are like, that's what I want to be. And Princip himself, talk about it next class, I think. But pretty in detail, Princip already, remember this is the 18 year old kid who shoots the first shots of the war. Princip already 1911, 1912 is like getting into fights with people with brass knuckles over like Austria. Like he'll go door to door, do you support us or hungry? Boom, you know, like whatever. Like he's all in in a very sad way. It's not surprising when people lose their nerve in Sarajevo. I told you the first class, he doesn't. He's living in this whole kind of thing here. I mean, these great absurdian epics about, you know, no matter what, all that matters is revanchism, like Alsace Lorraine. All that matters is getting back and building greater Serbia. And to die for it isn't like an option. Hey, Trisha, I need you to carry out a mission. Uh, for Serbian nationalism. And if you die, well, that's, that's the risk you have to take. No, you want to die. It's like a kamikaze mission. It's even better to die. So you see there's this very, very problematic kind of like approach, scary kind of approach building in this time where everyone is kind of touching the hot oven. Okay, number six, Ooh, another huge star. Italy, now this is, yeah, this is gonna be like, oh, wow. Um, so I'm not gonna say anymore. <laughs> that's all I gotta say. <laughs> Yeah, it's an infomercial. If you try our cream, four easy payments of 
If you try our cream, you'll be like, wow, your skin will be like, I have never, no oh. way. Please pay now. <laughs> wait, there's more. But the, wait, there's more. <laughs> if for only 17 more payments of $685.21, <laughs> all you have to do is send your social security number to us. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then, then the kind of like a disclaimer, like, yeah. If, uh, if your life's completely ruined and everything is stolen and your identity is stolen, you know, they're, they're uh, then your responsibility will go super, super fast. Uh, by the way, buy our product. 1911. Someone, someone once said, my, my father in law was here and he was, some guy was doing a car commercial. And uh, my dad, he's like, uh, that guy should probably lay off the coffee. I bet if I watch his back later, like, that guy's on something. Like, what is he like? Whoa, 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 whoa. What is he doing? You know, like, like he's way too, he's way too wired. Well, you know what? Uh, you know what? Internet, I blame Monica's coffee shop because they put 17 shots of espresso in my coffee. And now I, I can't, like, I can't hold, I can't hold my coffee cup. 1911, Italy. Why is it so, why is it so wow and commercial? You're wondering. Well, Italy fights the Ottomans in Ethiopia. Italy, Ethiopia's in Africa. I don't have to specify. I hope you know that. Italy, the boot country that extends down to the Mediterranean by Africa, I hope I have to explain that either, very close, wants to get involved in this. What do I mean? Italy wants to get involved in the scramble for Africa. What am I talking about? What if I told you that Italy unifies the country in 1871, the same year the German Empire does? And they also want a place in the sun, okay? Mm -hmm. So what's the answer? I've already, I've already given the answer. Is it just time to go to Rosario's and buy those delicious Rosario's bars? <laughs> I want to just I want to just include something in my sentence that made no sense to get you to give me the right answer. What 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 do I mean by scramble Africa? What am I talking about? You mean scrambled egg bars? Not scrambled egg bars. No. Yeah, at Rosaris, though. At Rosaris, no. At Rosaris, there's something called no. They're like they're like um, they have like raisins in them. They have they're glazed and they have they're like cookie batter. Oh, you mean like in the bakery? In the bakery section, yeah. Sorry. Such is life. <laughs> Italy wants to get territory, wants their own place in the sun. That is the answer. <laughs> Who owns Ethiopia? Dominic earlier talked about the Ottomans. The Ottomans are involved everywhere in the Balkans. Okay. That's why there's tons of mosques in Sarajevo. The Ottoman influence. Where what is the Ottoman base? I don't think I have to see I think you know Turkey, the modern country of Turkey. It's in Turkey itself, you know, on the Bosphorus, Constantinople, Istanbul, which is it's right there on Europe, right? Turkey is like, is it European or not? It's a great question. It's very Eurasian. Italy has to fight the Ottomans. Who wins the Italy versus Ottoman battle in Ethiopia? It was the first domino. Who do you think wins? Italy does. What are they exposed about the Ottomans? We thought, we Europeans, we Austro-Hungarians or Russians, thought the Ottomans were very what? And what does this prove? This arguably is, you could say, is the start of World War I, 1911, the Italians start World War I. You'll see why in a second. What do, what do they prove about the Ottomans? What do they prove? That they're... they're a joke. So what should we do? So we should do what about the Ottomans? Italy, which, are you serious? Like they really, they took a break from like being drunk on wine and eating their pasta under trees, like and taking, oh, a siesta from uh, eight in the morning to eight at night every day. They, those people actually, Kick the Ottomans' butt. Yes. What, what should we do? What should we other European countries do? It's what on the Ottomans? It's time to declare, what is the American colloquialism? Time to declare blank blank on the Ottomans. Open season on the Ottomans. If the Italians were able to seize Ethiopia so, so easily, maybe we can just go and take all the stuff from the Ottomans, get Ottoman Turkey completely out of Europe. That's what happens. Number seven, 1912 was the first Balkan War. Number one, massive Ottoman loss versus an entire Balkan coalition. Again, this is, oh man, this is so important. I hope, let's, let's really get this. You understand? In 1911, Italy cracks open the, the, the soda of Coca-Cola, whatever, for the first time and shows the Ottomans are a paper tiger. They're massive, but they're kind of impotent. They're not as strong as they seem. They're actually not strong at all. So the Balkan War, which follows next year, 1912, how far away are we from World War I? We're very close, right? 1912, the first Balkan War is a massive Ottoman loss against a Balkan coalition. Who's in the Balkan coalition? Bulgaria, Serbia, Montenegro, these European countries under Ottoman influence in some way. And they really throw the Ottomans basically out of Europe. The second Balkan War in 1913, ooh, we're a year away from our conflict. 
The second Balkan War too, Bulgaria versus the coalition equals Serbia grows by 80%. Serbia is the great victor of the first and second Balkan Wars. They're part of the coalition in 1912 that gets the Ottomans out, they gain more territory, good. But in the second coalition, Bulgaria, which used to be a friend, is like, okay, now I'm gonna fight my old friends because the Ottomans are gone, I'm gonna fight and they get their butt kicked. The Bulgarians do, it should be a massive arrow down. So Serbia gets even more territory. I'm asking you a question. How is this now for our hot oven touching important vis-a-vis -vis the Serbian Austrian relationship? How? We have the assassination, we have all the kind of irredentism, we have the annexation, we have the pig war. What do you think Austria-Hungary thinks about Serbia having grown by 80% in two years? What do they think? That we must do what? What must we do in Austria-Hungary? We must solve the Serbian problem before it metastasizes out of control. They're perhaps a terrorist country run by these guys row three, and they hate our guts and they're growing. And maybe it's going to get too late pretty soon. Hmm. That's why Conrad von Hotzendorf, remember the guy who his every answer is declare war on Serbia no matter what? Conrad, we need another answer though. Okay, how about on Serbia declare war? We need something else. War, period. War exclamation. He's war everything. That kind of brain trust in Austria Hungary, long before this happens, our real cause of the war. Right? Long before that, they're like, we need to solve this problem before it becomes a real problem. I hope you who all came to the first class have seen now. Maybe you that I think that story was pretty good. You know, it was a nice introduction in class, sad with the assassinations, but it's like you hear that, you've never done anything. It's like, wow, you see already now where all this comes out of. When you hear the assassination story for the second time in a different way, I'll tell it in a shorter version. But when you hear it again, now you know all of the stuff that's behind it. Hmm. Okay, and a final point. Yes, David. Oh, you can make your point. No, you make your point. I, I'm just, as I said earlier, I'm kind of looking at some of these maps that you talk, and, um, and I'm not. Since you're not showing us maps. I will show you maps. Since you're not showing us maps. Well, anyway, we all have the technology to see these maps. Um, Dave, just make your point. What are you talking about? I'm talking about <laughs> Italy and how far away it is from Ethiopia. Okay. And again, back in 19, what? You know, Talk about travel and tech. Yeah, you're right. About travel. You're not taking a fighter jet uh, strafing exactly. over. Exactly. Yeah. And so for them to, to mobilize and march all the way down there, it's just kind of amazing to me that yeah. they weren't stopped or whatever. Yeah. 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 No, no. I, I mean, that, that's, but again, that perhaps furthers the problem here. All of that Egypt, all that is, you know, the British soon will come over and in control and they have parts, but all that area of Africa, in some, in some ways, is under Ottoman influence. So how much more so that to get to Ethiopia, they also can't be stopped by the Ottomans that they're going to fight, like just a total breakdown of the Ottoman capacity to defend their empire at all, which declares open season and all that. Final cause between night in this time period, Anglo-British naval race. You can say this begins kind of in 1898, all the way up to the war. The British who own the sea, who have a two to one power rule, Meaning the British, I could say very selfishly, are like, we're going to always have double the ships everyone else. If I have 10 ships, Dave Schmidt's the chancellor of Germany, he's only allowed to have four, or he can have five. But if he has six, that's like an active war. And you rightfully can say, wait, you have 10. I can have, 10 would be equal. No, no, I need a two to one ratio. The Germans who are feeling entrapped, please write that word down. It's an actual like phrase this time, entrapment, or encirclement. The Germans who are between who? What's the Schlieffen plan going to be, right? Attack France, then Germany. They're between, attack France, then Russia. They're between uh, uh, these two great powers and they have England hovering over them in the seas. They're trying to build a naval art, naval fleet that can compete with the British. Well, the British did this provocation. That's another cause of the war. In fact, you can say the switch from Pax Britannica in 1871 to Pax Germanica to the, the, the German hegemony in Europe is really going to be a massive factor in that rivalry. Can you say that the First World War is Britain versus Germany? In some ways, yeah. Britain's probably the most important ally, and ally and even though France takes such an amazing brunt of the thing and forever rejects the stereotype of the French of like cowards running away. The French are so brave in the First World War, fight so valiantly. You can say that, um, that it's really kind of Germany versus, Germany versus um, Britain. And as for Austria-Hungary, which is probably my favorite player in all this, I love Austria-Hungary. The Germans refer to them very early in the war. It's, it's like being shackled to a corpse. Austria-Hungary sucks. The Germans, basically. 
Um, so whatever that's worth. We'll talk about why that's the case. It's not exactly true, but it really becomes kind of Germany versus France and Britain. And Americans come in at the end, and like Americans are wanting to do. Americans come in and do 5% of the work and take all the credit, right? Um, but that's actually not true at all. Like I said, again, if we don't come in the war, the Allies lose the war. We were, do we do win the war in 1918? In fact, so much of German planning is based on that fear that when the Americans come, we're going to have no answer. If they have fresh supplies, fresh men, not jaded by the reality of trench warfare. And the Americans fight brilliantly. Chateau Thierry and Pershing, the, the whole 100 days offensive. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah, right. Okay, so free listen. Three things, because it will argue 20th cause. What's the biggest thing about 1789, 1869? Probably the kind of battle between autocracy and liberalism. We talk, we, this is the first class to talk about, the second class. But we said, you know, from the French Revolution through uh, from that time, you know, is it power to the people or power to the king, the monarchs, whatever. Um, 1870, 1903, we talked so much about this, but why, why does it end 1903? This is the cutoff date, right? Obviously. 1870, again, the main cause in there is Alsace Lorraine, Bismarckian diplomacy to switch from, from real to felt politic. And then 1904, 1913, we don't have to talk about, we talk about today. But if you look today at the, I think I have nine points, and yesterday I had 10, that's 19, so not quite 20, but around 20 real strong causes the outbreak of the First World War. So as I show you, I'm going to turn the, the photos now. Does anybody have any questions, really? Anything whatsoever? I, I think, really, you guys are. Man, if I gave you five causes, if we entered World War I class, I'm like, talk about Alsace-Lorraine, Serbian assassination, annexation of Bosnia, Herzegovina, even three, that's three. That's not bad. And Italy opening the box. Okay. But is, I'm assuming no one is confused and people get this. Is that true? Or who is confused? Uh, please ask me. Is there, any, is there any confusion whatsoever about, I'm not asking you to understand it perfectly. It's not the question, of course. I'm saying, do you see what is leading up to what we're going to talk about next class when we return to Sarajevo and they start the war in the July crisis? I mean, see the kind of conflicting interests, the problems, the brewing stuff. Yes or no? <clears throat> okay, well, that's actually all I have for you. Uh, sorry. No maps. No maps. No just pictures. That, no pictures. Just that slide. What's the Russian yes? Yes, I have pictures. Thank you. I didn't. Brilliant. Thank you. Really, I forgot to mention. It. Exactly. Excellent. I can say another cause. In 1905, the same year as the, of the Moroccan crisis, the Russians have their Ottoman Morocco moment, uh, Ottoman Ethiopia moment. Hey, the Russians are great. They're, they're the biggest. And unfortunately, because of racism. It's like, we're the, we're the Europeans, the Asian races, you know, that kind of, that, that was the way the Russians thought. They're beneath us, we're gonna easily defeat them. The Japanese hand it to the Russians. They destroy the Russians in this war. In fact, Theodore Roosevelt wins the Nobel prize for mediating the peace. The Russo-Japanese exposes the French, exposes the Russians, excuse me, as a kind of impotent power, the way Ethiopia does for the Ottomans. We talked a lot about that. So if you understand that, same exact thing. Thought the Russians were great, ooh. Really, Japan kicked their butt? Uh, well, well, how strong are they really? And it creates the Duma. The Duma is basically the Congress. It lowers the Tsar's power by a tick. I can't tell you how awesome it would be bizarre in 1900. You had absolute power. I mean, that's very bad and scary, but if you're, a good, you, you're, if you're into autocracy, you like no, no, no restraints, that was the time. The Tsar could do whatever he wanted. He was literally above the law, he was the law. 1905 is the first kind of constitutional introduction because the Tsar has to come. There's a big revolution in Russia in 1905, kind of a, a dry run for 1917. We'll talk a lot about that in November with the Russian Revolution, but that, that's what that is. I would have totally forgot. The after effect, 1903. Entente cordiale, very good. Shake hands. I don't know which flag is. Britain and France. Yeah, I don't know which one is Britain, which one is France. I forgot, but they're there. <laughs> I'm kidding. If the you don't, both, we know that. red, white, and blue. It's very, it's a very American moment. It's like looking at these grayscale colors is impressive. We can tell anyway. Yeah, you can still tell. Oh. Okay, here's more Entente cordiale. Really good pixelation of this photo, um, as well. Here, <laughs> kind of like a little postcard, right? You can send out to your friends, Hey, thousand years we've made up, we're, we're all good. 
Kaiser Wilhelm in Morocco. Evenement du Maroc is French for the events in, in Morocco. Uh, Wilhelm, he's the one with the maple cap. Which one is Wilhelm? Uh, right I side. think, I, actually, no, I think he's not pictured in this. It's one of his, um, yeah, so, so the, the, it's, it's his colonel. So the inscription says in the bottom, Tangier, Morocco, the Colonel MacLeon gives instructions to his officers and troops, Christian troops, at the occasion of the arrival of the Emperor William II. Uh, Captain the port. Uh, and what's the last part here? Uh, accompanying the accompanying the ministers on on the, the the walk, the kind of the the event, et cetera. So Wilhelm's not actually pictured in this, but just that. What, what year was that? Nineteen o five. Okay, this is the kind of picture caption political cartoon pig war, um, like mocking it in a certain sense. Here, Ethiopia with the first use of aircraft in warfare, which is also an interesting development. Aircraft in World War I, unlike World War II, often used for reconnaissance purposes, for information and bomb dropping. And then here's actual flying photos of the Ethiopian War and the, uh, what's it called? The Balkan Wars is why I have some photo, photo for you. Keep these photos in mind. These are already kind of like rudimentary trenches, kind of standing trenches. Trench warfare, again, will dominate World War I. But again, nothing comes out of a vacuum. There's always precursors and things for, um, but these war photos, like these, this open here and people, you know, in a sense, marching kind of like, you know, freely, there's some movement, way too contrast the World War I battlefields which become completely static in some ways, completely dug in to the ground. So all these guys obviously have no idea, like you know, three years later, we're gonna be fighting the thing, the, the apocalyptic war, you can almost say. In fact, one of my favorite historians, Christopher Clark, says it's very important to realize before it became World War I, what was World War I? Before it became World War I, it was what? The Great War. No, before it became the Great War, it was what? It was the Third Balkan War. It's a local conflict, no big deal. No one thought it was going to escalate the way it did, right? But your, your point, too, it wasn't the answer I was looking for, but you're right as well. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. I read a book from 1927. Uh, analysis of the Great War, right? No one knew World War II like was coming. Yeah, the, it literally is called the War to End All Wars. Yeah, people didn't feel the envision 20 years later. More troops, generals, Betsy, here's your maps. This is Europe in 1914, okay? So uh, again, the Poland, I'm glad, I'm, I'm Polish. I'm, thank you for the shout out. This should not even be on there. Poland is not, this is part of all of Russia. All of that purple, thing is part of the Russian Empire at that time. Look how massive Austria-Hungary is, right? Look at this, BH. Why is it orange? That's the annexation of Bosnia-Herzegovina. These are the Balkans right here. And you see why this is so problematic. Austria-Hungary is here, Russia is here. I mean, it's almost like the, the stomach, the gut, right? Or the heart, it's right at the center of Europe, right? And here's Serbia, Bulgaria. Serbia, Bulgaria, Romania, these countries, they fight the Ottomans in the First Balkan War and then fight each other in Bulgaria. It's, for stepping on a line, Serbia gains territory. But look how, how look at the border here of Serbia. And this is Sarajevo, where the whole event happens. Germany, France, okay. The rest of the, I mean, the, your, sorry, no. uh, Montenegro, which literally, literally Montenegro means Black Mountain. Um, Montenegro, small mountainous country, where I'm not kidding that people could walk by and talk to the king. Montenegro was so redneck backwoods, like the king would sit and smoke a pipe outside his residence. I'm dead serious, no secret service, whatever. You're saying like, what's up, man? How you doing? Good. Uh, you wanna play cards? Yeah, you know, like, you wanna try some of this pipe? Yeah, it's good stuff. This is freaking German tobacco. Um, okay, here you see the alliances, right? Triple alliance, triple entente, different allies, right? France, UK, and Russia versus Germany. This is this is the map I had for you there. Okay, right. Again, today Austria-Hungary is Austria-Hungary and the Czech Republic and Slovenia and Slovakia. It's just 11, 11 nationalities. The fall of Przemysl, a city in modern-day Poland. The orders had to be read out in fifteen languages. I, you know how much I love languages. Is really problematic and awful for like a military order. And that's God bless the Romans. No, everything's in Latin. Right, freaking one language, and this kind of backwoods French dialect slang stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. The linguistic polyglot diverse nature is kind of interesting, but causes a lot of problems as well. Yeah, okay. I was thinking about um, 
when an African bishop came to Seattle in the 80s and um, so Latin mass or um, so Latin mass. And um, he said that um, in his diocese, they had so many languages spoken, not even more than a hundred, but that, that they couldn't possibly um, have the mass in one of those languages. They picked one tribe over another. So the mass was 